Well, welcome again this morning to this uh, virtual service at Hillcrest Bible Church. We're grateful that you are with us and or that you are um, able to listen to this after the fact. We come together this morning grateful for the work of our Lord Jesus Christ for us, which we would not know or understand apart from his word. Reading from Psalm 119, verse 140, Thy word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. And a little further down, in verse 160, Your word is true from the beginning, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Verse 162, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. Please join us this morning in Trinity number 133, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the salvation that we have in him. We're thankful for the blessings you give, and we pray that you will continue to uh, provide for each one of us. Uh, we pray that you will um, heal those who are sick and be a comfort to them. We pray your blessing uh, to be with them and upon them. We pray for our country, and we pray that uh, many people would recognize uh, the difficulties in this country to be traceable to our abandoning the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation in Him and your word. We pray that you would uh, awaken many to a saving knowledge of Christ, and we pray that you would revive your church. We ask always uh, for your grace and mercy in our hearts and lives. Bless uh, the teaching and preaching of the word. In Jesus' name uh, we pray, amen. Well, this is our second uh, coronavirus church message. And this means that I'm preaching to empty pews, but these pews are not really empty because I'm preaching to you. Um, but it will be much better when we are all gathered here uh, again. And perhaps that will be happening soon. Um, I certainly hope so. But for the present, we continue to be careful along with the rest of the people in Oregon and, um, and uh, meet when it's uh, the appropriate time for us to meet. As I was preparing this message, I was thinking about our relationship with God. Um, just as it is strange for us to be separated from one another here at Hillcrest Bible Church, it is even more odd for people to be separated from God. And every living being is totally dependent upon God for at least physical life. Not everyone has a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and not everyone is thankful to God for the physical life even that God gives to them, but everyone is a recipient of God's uh, providential care and uh, the life that he gives physically. But we are born into this world spiritually dead, and only God can save us, and he does so by giving us spiritual life and eternal life. And we understand that this life comes from Him. And we, as the Lord's people, are continually thankful for the totality of life that He gives, physical life, spiritual life, and eternal life. And Peter wrote his second epistle to encourage our relationship with God in Christ. And uh, to give the big picture, to illustrate, let me uh, help you draw a picture. And if you have pencil and paper, you can do this uh, in front of you, but uh, draw a circle to the left side of the page and leave room on the right side, but on the left side, draw a large circle, and in that large circle, write the word God. And uh, this represents God. I'm always a little nervous when I put a circle around God because God is a transcendent God, and He is... Uh, eternal, he is uh, omnipresent, uh, he is infinite in his being, and it's always difficult to draw a circle around God, but um, just for the time being, put a circle around God, and then right next to that, I want you to draw another circle, and in this circle, and the circle should touch, in this circle, write Jesus Christ, and uh, then over on the far right side of the paper, draw a little bitty circle and put man in it. And what I mean by man is mankind, so if that's for men and women. Um, but if uh, it helps you, you can put the word me underneath that. And I'm not speaking of me, me. I'm speaking of you, me, if that makes sense. But it's referring to you. So the little circle represents you. You have God in a big circle, Jesus Christ, and then you off to the side. From Jesus Christ, draw an arrow that goes right over to where you are, the little circle. And above that, write the word provision. And this is all that God in Christ provides for us. And the arrow indicates, you could put above that provision, you could put grace as well, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, but it's, it's all that he provides for us. The provision of salvation, the provision of life, 
spiritual life, eternal life, the totality of life, all that God gives to us, just draw the arrow pointing to where you are. And then underneath that arrow, point an arrow going back toward Jesus Christ. And on that arrow, write faith. And this uh, arrow represents um, everything that you receive by faith. And really the arrow, we're pointing it to Jesus Christ because it's faith in Him. Uh, faith could also point back to us as well because uh, uh, it is the gift of God and uh, God works in our hearts. But I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of our believing in Him. And faith really represents believing and trusting and depending and abiding and obeying and serving and praising and worshiping. That is our response to God. He provides for us. We're responding to Him by receiving. Now your drawing is completed, unless you want to add colors. And if you do that, you're on your own. You can add your own colors. But this drawing represents this relationship that we have with God. And Peter is seeking to encourage that relationship in his second, uh, the first chapter of his second epistle. And he's already written about the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God is the two big circles, that God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. And that's the, the, the knowledge of God, the true knowledge of God he speaks of. And Peter also wants to strengthen our faith. But you'll notice that Peter strengthens our faith by emphasizing the truth about God. And this absolute truth about God, that, that it is true forever. And the way that you strengthen faith is by strengthening the object of our faith, and that involves not only God himself, but the, the truth that God reveals. It's not, faith cannot make something true. In fact, there are people who believe uh, in things that are not true, and their faith does not make them true. What makes faith true is the object of our faith. And if the object of our faith is true, then our faith is directed in the right place. Our faith is authentic because the truth that we believe is real. And Peter wants all believers to know that their faith in Jesus Christ is firmly placed based upon the eternal rock of God's truth, the immovable rock of God's truth. So in this passage where he talks about the true knowledge of God, and in this passage where he talks about the truth, he then emphasizes that what he and the other apostles both saw and heard verify the fact that they're believing the truth. And I want you to, I'm going to read these verses of Scripture. I want to read 2 Peter um, chapter 1, verses uh, 16, 17, and 18. He says this, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now he makes this statement, if you look at the text of scripture, in light of, first of all, beginning with in verse 3 by saying, that God in His divine power has given us to everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him. Peter is emphasizing the true knowledge of God and the importance of us knowing the true knowledge of God and growing in that true knowledge. He says in verse 4 that His promises have a purpose, that you might be partakers of the divine nature, that you might become like Christ. That's God's purpose. And in verse 11 he goes on to say in this way, entrance into his, the eternal kingdom, will be abundantly supplied to you. So Peter's saying, I, I'm going to emphasize to you the truth and your faith in the truth, because in that passage he also tells how to build your faith. And if this is the truth, you need to build your faith in the truth. And in verse 12 he begins to give a personal word of testimony, and a personal word, and he says, therefore, 
I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth which is present with you. So Peter says, I'm, I'm dying. I'm not, uh, I, I, know, I don't think he knew exactly what, when he was going to die, but he knew the Lord and what the Lord had said to him. So I knew that uh, death was something that was going to happen to him in the not too distant future. And so he was, had a degree of urgency about him and saying, okay, I want you to understand that what we have presented, what we the apostles have presented to you, is the truth. Now, now notice uh, how he says this. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales. And the word he uses for follow is a word that means to, to not just to follow something, but to behave in agreement with something. You, you are following because you are behaving in a manner. You are following, and the disciples were following the Lord Jesus Christ wherever he went, but you're following in, in agreement with what you're observing. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised tales. And uh, a cleverly devised tale would mean that they had invented some ingenious historical myth the word that you literally use there for tales is the word myth. So he's saying we as disciples didn't sit down and we say, you know, Jesus is really a great person. He's really nice and everything. And, but, but we need to, you know, elevate him a little bit more. Let's, let's turn him into God. Let's make him to be a God. And so we made up all these stories. And he says, that never happened. And we were following because we were believing in him. Our behavior indicated our, our continued trust in Him. And when He makes this kind of statement, this is always a little bit of a dangerous kind of statement to make because He's speaking to people who were alive when Jesus was alive. He's speaking to people who have memory of this. And these are people that could come back and say, this never happened. I mean, just think for a moment if someone would say, maybe of one of our presidents, one of our recent presidents. That president was the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is God. And we would all say, no, not, <laughs> not of any of the recent presidents. And we would be able to cite things about them, um, all of them, that indicate that they are not without sin. They are not the essence of the righteousness of God. But Peter is saying, we followed this Jesus around. We never saw him sin. We never saw him treat anyone in a sinful manner. We never saw him do anything that is contrary to his claim of being the Son of God. It never happened. In fact, the things that we observed are from that truth. And so he says, we didn't sit down and have some agreement to make some myth for everyone to believe. But what we have made known to you, and says, this really means to, to cause you to know, what we've caused you to come to know, is the power, the powerful coming, power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And some people take this word for power, this word that is used for dunamis, and the coming is parousia. And uh, some have said it's not just power and coming, but his, his powerful coming. And, and then people debate a little bit whether they're talking about his first coming and his second coming. And I would say from an Old Testament perspective, there's the coming, and those two comings really are really one. But I think the greater emphasis is upon here in this passage is on his first coming. And we saw this powerful coming. And we observed it. And we saw that Jesus Christ had power over disease. And he exercised power over demons. And over nature and over death. In all the signs and wonders that he performed. I think, by the way, it's interesting when you think of demon possession. I think demon possession was probably more common in Jesus' day 
than it was in, in our day today. People ask, if, are people demon-possessed today? And I say, I really don't know. I've never seen anyone that I ever thought was demon-possessed, but I, don't, I just don't know. But I do think that it was a comment in the day of Jesus Christ because it was as if Satan said, okay, you're going to God, to God, you're going to do the incarnation. And uh, he saw what had taken place with reference to the Lord Jesus Christ being born. And so uh, Satan said, well, I can do that. And I can have demons possess human beings. And I can, I can, I can mimic that to, to just show that uh, it can be done by spiritual forces. What's interesting about that is that Jesus Christ displayed his power over the demons by commanding them to come out. And they submitted to his authority. So it was perhaps Satan's intention of saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to diminish the idea of the incarnation by repetition over and over again of demon possession, when in fact what the demon possession did was emphasize the authority of Jesus Christ because the demons submitted to him. And when he said, get out, they got out. And uh, they had to obey him. It's just interesting. But they saw this powerful ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. A ministry where people came and he healed all of them. Not some of them, all of them. Where he raised the dead. Great miracles that he performed. Then he also had the power to create the feeding of the 5,000. He had the power to forgive sins. He had the power to die and to resurrect himself. He has the power to ascend into glory. They saw all of this. He had the power to reveal God, the powerful and authoritative teaching. They watched all of this. And certainly the power to save. So they were personal witnesses of the ministry of Jesus Christ. They walked with him for three years. They walked with him for three years and they stand up now and say, this is the Son of God. Amazing. And uh, look back at John uh, chapter 1. And uh, John and Peter uh, both sing the same song. They're, 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 they're proclaiming the same truth. And if you look at uh, the prologue of, of uh, John's gospel, John chapter 1, look at verses 14 and following. Speaking about the Word who's with God, the Word who was God, and he says in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, and here he's speaking of John the Baptist, John the Baptist bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. It's an amazing statement that is made. This prologue is like saying, okay, I'm going to tell you about this one who is God Himself, who has come to this earth, has been displayed to be and is the Son of God. I'm going to tell you about His life and ministry. And then, Turn in 1 John chapter 1, and you see John beginning with that same emphasis in his first epistle. Reading from John, 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness to declare to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you that your joy may be made full. This is... Uh, an amazing emphasis and Peter saying the same thing. He's saying uh, we have uh, this assurance and uh, we have seen him and he says uh, in this text we have we have witnessed we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We have watched his majesty. And then he goes on to speak of another instance which uh, 
Peter, James, and John uh, all observed this one, and that's the uh, transfiguration uh, on the mount. And uh, I was reading when one commentary said this is Mount Tabor. Uh, that's probably a weak tradition. We don't really know exactly where the mount was, but we know what happened on the mount. And again, turn in your Bibles back to Matthew chapter 17, and let me read this account to you. Matthew chapter 17, the first nine verses. Actually, let me begin in the verse 28 that is before. Jesus Christ is speaking about the things uh, that are going to take place, and he says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then it continues with a connective statement. This is probably one of those places where a chapter division shouldn't be here, but it says, Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and they brought them up on a high mountain by themselves and was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to the Lord, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while it was still speaking, behold, this is sort of interesting that happens, this, this bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. That's sort of the concluding statement. But then it says, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And they go on to have a conversation about this, but... I think what both John and Peter are doing in their writings is they're writing about this, and Peter is, is very direct in his uh, writing about this uh, because he says in verses 17 and 18, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. I think that excellent glory may be that cloud that came down upon them. And as this cloud comes down upon them, they have this this wonderful moment where they're, they're standing and they hear the voice of God. And hearing the voice of God caused them to fall flat on their faces. And uh, Jesus comes to them. But uh, it, it's a wonderful moment. But they, they, they heard this and they heard the voice of God making it. And this voice, by the way, was it says uh, a voice that was spoken to him. It was a voice coming, you should say, to them, but it was a voice that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ to affirm the significance of who He is. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with Him on the holy mountain. We heard this voice. And here we have this, again, uh, the statement about the honor and the glory of, of uh, Christ appearing and, and His being, Christ appearing here in glory, and the Father uh, substantiating really that this is the one. This is, it doesn't say I have many sons and this might be one of them, this may be the Son of God, there was no, this is, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And in some of the other passages, there are other words in Matthew, it says, listen to him, and Mark says, listen to him, and keep on listening, is what the indication of that statement is. Luke says, my chosen one, listen to him. I'm sure Jesus, or God the Father, spoke all of those words. But clearly, this is what is stated here uh, in this passage. This is my beloved Son. And what Peter is saying, and what John is saying, is that that is true. That is the truth. This is the beloved Son of God. 
This is God the Father speaking about God the Son. This is God speaking about God. We have the true Messiah. We have the truth of God. If you're believing in Jesus Christ, you are believing in the absolute truth of which there is no wavering. This is God's truth. This is His Word. And we observed it with our eyes, and we heard it with our ears, and there was never a moment when we as the apostles ever said, maybe this is not the Messiah. Maybe He's not the Son of God. Maybe a Messiah would, wouldn't do these kinds of things. Or a Messiah, we've seen him sin, we've seen him do same things that were really just as sinful as we are sinful. They never observed that. I don't even know what it would be like to be walking with someone who was perfect for three years. You can't spend three minutes with people without finding out that they're not perfect and they can walk with you and find out you're not perfect in three minutes. And with me. To be perfect means not only the absence of sin, but also means the presence of, of an adoring God relationship in Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus Christ fulfilled the statement, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your mind. That means all the time you're loving God. That was true of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything he did, he is loving God with all of his being the whole of that time. And loving his neighbor as himself, always. Never time when that was not taking place. So it's not only the absence of sin, it's the presence of righteousness. And the righteousness of Christ is clearly declared. And the disciples are saying, we never saw a contradiction in that. So they're saying one of the evidences that we have that your faith and trust is in the right person is because of our observation of him. I mean, we heard it. We saw it. And our faith and trust is, is, is in this one, this one who is the truth and speaks the truth and knows the truth. And if Peter is going to say, you need to grow in your faith, it's interesting that both that, that his last epistle, the thing that he's most concerned about, is that people know the truth. He's going to talk about false teachers in chapter 2. He's going to talk about those who are mockers in chapter 3. But he's talking about the truth now. And he says, you need to know that you have that truth. It is most important, you know, you know, to understand that because in days when, like the days we're living in now, where there's a, a lot of fear, fear about disease, fear about the coronavirus, fear about death, and it's possible when people live in a state of fear is that their circumstances dominate their truth. And their circumstances determine their truth. When we become a, a Christians, the Bible is the Word of God, and the Bible is our truth. And so we bring our circumstances to the Bible for the Bible to speak authoritatively to our circumstances. So even when we go through difficult times like we're going through now as a... As a city, as a state, as a nation, even as the world, even when you go through these difficult circumstances, we don't look at the circumstances and then respond to the circumstances as if the circumstances have dominion over us. God has dominion over us. And God has uh, an, any number of purposes that he's accomplishing in a day like today. He can have a purpose for every single individual on planet Earth, in addition to having purposes for nations, in addition to having purposes for churches, in addition to having purposes in many different ways. But we bring ourselves and we come to the Bible and we say, okay, I'm going through difficult circumstances, but this is what I know. I know that God is sovereign and he's accomplishing his purposes. 
I know that God is summing up all things in Jesus Christ. I know that God is good and all wise and always loving in his treatment of me and of his people. I know that God will accomplish his purposes in all of the circumstances of his life, but this, this world does not define God and this world does not define the Bible. God defines this world. And when you understand the truth and that you have the truth of God, it's not only just so you can say, well, you know, Peter says it's the truth and John says it's the truth, so I'm just believing it's the truth. If it is the truth, then it has authority in our lives. And it also gives us assurance. And this uh, passage was written that we might have great assurance that we're not believing some fable, that the disciples made something up and just there's uh, people today who want to even say that kind of thing. We're believing the truth. And we're looking to those, at those who were eyewitnesses who address the very issue. And they say you have the truth. And also this is given that we might have diligence. And being diligent about believing the truth and knowing the truth and knowing God's word. And believing the promises and living according to the promises of God and the truth of God. May God help us to be students of the Word of God and be growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is what is needed in our hearts. It's what's needed in our nation. It's what's needed in our church. It's what's needed everywhere. The knowledge of God, the truth of God. Peter says, you have the truth. Now, let's go back to the chart again we talked about at the very beginning. And underneath the uh, circle of Jesus Christ, I want you to write number one and number two. And under number one, you can say, Jesus Christ, as witnessed by the apostles. That's number one, as witnessed by the apostles. And the second one you can write, what you will learn if you come back next week. Actually, what you can read ahead and see is as witnessed by the Holy Spirit. What Peter does is he says, we as the apostles witness this truth, but there's someone who's even greater in witnessing this truth, and God the Holy Spirit witnesses that what we're believing is the absolute truth. So be confident in God, be confident in the promises of God. If you're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're believing in the truth. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, come to Christ. He is the Savior, He is the Son of God. And if you believe that He died and rose again in order that you might be saved, come to Christ, believe Him, just receive the promises of God. God saves sinners, He saves us. And our hope and trust is in Him. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, be living under the authority of God's Word, have great assurance, and be diligent in pursuing the truth. Our hope and trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your faithfulness in our lives. We're thankful that You, Father, have revealed the truth to us. And we are confident based upon the, the witness, the personal witness, eyewitness, and ear witness of the apostles, we are confident and even confident, even more so, in the strong witness of the Holy Spirit. We know, Father, you want us to know that we have your truth and that the Bible is your word. Help us to know that. And we pray for the many people who do not know you, who do not know Jesus Christ, who do not believe in the Bible, and we pray that you would open their hearts to see the truth and come to Christ. Thank you for the blessings that you give. And may your blessing be upon us. We pray for those who are suffering with sickness. We pray that you would heal them. We pray that you would protect their lives. We commit them into your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the Trinity hymnal number 116, number 116.
Please join us in our benediction, Grace Hymnal number 437.